If you have your Bibles, open up with me for, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. That was so weak. Nate, we get excited about the word in here. Isn't that right? Amen. Open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Tonight, we continue our We Need to Talk series. Can we restart the clock? That's okay. I don't know if we can do that, Alex, but can we restart the clock? We'll just call that an introduction. We continue our series, We Need to Talk, and it's a relationship series. Now, the Bible doesn't speak on dating, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about evaluation. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about decision-making at its core. And last week, we laid the foundation, if you will, of what the Bible says about decision-making, about relationships, about evaluation. We laid this foundation of what it really looks like to date in a godly way, how to own your singleness. Well, tonight we talk about the fellas. Fellas, where we at? Make some noise for me. Amen? Tonight we talk about the fellas. Next week we talk about the ladies. The title of the sermon is this, Let's Talk About Him. Let's talk about him. Me and my wife spent a week in Los Angeles back in July. Anybody been to L.A.? Amen? That's right. I love the city of Los Angeles. I spent a week, in, a week in Los Angeles, Sid. I loved being in L.A. I'm a big Laker fan. Kobe Bryant's the greatest player of all time, obviously. They did restart the clock. Y'all some real ones. Thank you, guys. And uh, I love Kobe Bryant. I think he was the greatest of all time. So me and my wife, we got to tour Los Angeles. We got to go around the city. We saw Staples Center. We went to the, what's the uh, over, oversight place called? Griffith Observatory, went to Griffith Observatory, it's been a long Monday, guys, and you know, <laughs> Griffith Observatory, where you can oversee the city of Los Angeles, and uh, we did a lot of stuff, ate some good food, spent some time together. Ever since me and my wife have been married, we've tried to not only date each week, but we've tried to travel together each year, and uh, we've gone to some amazing places like New York, Los Angeles. While we were in L.A., we went down to San Diego for a day, and man, loved it. If you haven't been out west, I encourage you to take a trip out west. It's amazing what God is doing out there, but it's also amazingly beautiful, too. While we were in L.A., we took a day, Sam, and went down to San Diego. And uh, when we went to San Diego, Hannah, excuse me, she took me to this beach, and it blew my mind. We walked up to it. You couldn't get to the beach, though, because it was cut off by a guardrail. So hear me out for a minute. There were all these people, crowds of people standing around, Delaney, but you couldn't get to the beach. And so I'm looking, I'm like, man, something crazy must be happening in those waters. Like, they must have found a whale ashore. (laughs) Like, what are these folks looking at? And so you got to get fight through the crowds of people to see what they're looking at. And uh, you get to the railing, and you look over the beach, and uh, what you see is you see sea lions everywhere on the beach. And uh, here's what's fascinating. Uh, There's a picture that's going to come up in a minute, I think. Uh, When you see these sea lions on the shore, here they are. This is what it looks like. (laughs) Look at this. That's me after sugar cookies. (laughs) And all the people I force fed <laughs> are house guests. <laughs> Man, it's amazing. <laughs> they are so lazy. And uh, <clears throat> this is what you see. They're laying everywhere. And you've got these crowds and crowds of people watching them, literally, hear me out for a minute, do nothing. <laughs> like all these tourists are standing at the guardrail, Kobe Drake, and they're watching, me included, watching these sea lions do nothing. And it was cute at first. At first, you're like, oh, those things are so adorable. Look at them tossing and turning back over. And then it gets to a point where I got bored. And I looked at Hannah, and I was was like, is this it? (laughs) You know? And I was like, not the only one. There were some little kids over there madder than I was. They were like, Ma, they're so big. Why aren't they doing nothing? And the mom was like, shh. They are doing something. (laughs) They're laying there doing nothing. (laughs) And I was watching. I was amazed. Literally, they, they get to this point where they get stuck in the sand, and they don't move. And here's what's amazing. All the people by the guardrails, no matter how much we wave their arms or shouting, you know, making noises, trying to get them to move, Bree, no matter what we did, they would not move. They stayed stuck in one place. They did nothing, Lindsay. And uh, I was bored, and I wrote this down. I wrote down that, and watch this. Um, there's a point to this. What was cute at first became draining very quickly. Uh-oh. Somebody knows where I'm going, and they're like, oh, snap, this might hurt a little bit. <laughs> now, this might hurt a little bit. What's tonight's sermon about? Men, that's right. <laughs> oh, snap. Oh, snap. I see where this illustration going. I see where this illustration going. Tonight, we do, there's a reason I'm telling you about sea lions. Tonight, we're talking about what the Bible says a godly man is. Hear me out for a minute. Don't be mad at me. But can I tell you one of the great tragedies in our nation when it comes to men today? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to, I, I, look, it is what it is. In our culture today, 
What we have is we have a lot of men who live their lives spiritually like sea lions. In other words, what I wrote down is when it comes to their faith, they're stuck in one spot, and it's largely because they're passive. In other words, too many men aren't really moving in their faith because they enjoy, like those sea lions, laying on the spiritual sidelines and living for the attention of people. That's why I love Paul's exhortation. Hear me out. That's why I love Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 4.1. He says this. He says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to what? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. All over scripture, the exhortation is to walk. Do you know why? Because as human beings, if we are not chasing after God, we will literally sit in one place and do nothing. Those sea lions were idle, and there's a lot of men in our culture who are idle too. Jesus was never idle, but he was prayerful. See, those sea lions lay there, and they're contributing nothing. They're not interacting with each other. They're just laying there. And there's a lot of men who don't really interact with each other in a godly way. They're just kind of laying on the spiritual sidelines. They're apathetic because they're not active in their faith. The great downfall is we have too many sea lions as men living out our spiritual faith. In fact, one thing I wrote down is a lot of college guys don't interact with each other in a meaningful way. Be honest. We talk about fantasy football. We talk about sports, but when it comes to real, actual, godly conversations, and I know the men are like, I should not have come tonight. When it comes to that, we don't really dig in. And in a lot of marriages today, you know what you find? You find that the woman is trying to lead her man's faith. Ladies, you can never do it. You cannot lead his faith. Because those sea lions were cute at first, but begging them to move got old quick. And ladies, no matter how cute he is, brace. No matter how cute he is, if you have to beg him to go to church, if you have to beg him to go to life groups, if you have to beg him to own his faith when you're dating, what do you think it'll be like when you're married? Hello. We have too many men who are spiritual sea lions. We're laying on the sidelines spiritually. We don't want to get in the game. But what's amazing about sea lions when they get in the water, when they get into the game, they start doing, my wife laughed that I wrote this down, they start doing acrobats in the water. They start doing beautiful movements. They get into a routine. I got a picture that will come up of one in the water. Look at the difference. Look at the contrast of this beautiful specimen right here in the water. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. And one thing I wrote down is when men get off the spiritual sidelines, when they get off the beach, when they stop living for the approval of people, and they get in the water and start making their faith their own, they find a rhythm and they lead. Men, tonight... My prayer is that you would get off the spiritual sidelines. My prayer is that you would stop being okay with laying on the beach spiritually, accepting the attention of people, and that you would own your faith in a way that carries you throughout the rest of your life. That you, men, would focus on your relationship with Christ, your maturity, be obsessed with Jesus, and not be obsessed with any woman. Ladies, my prayer for you tonight is that this would help you with wisdom and discernment when it comes to dating, that there are red flags when it comes to dating. That just because he says he's a Christian does not mean he's a pursuer of God. There's a difference. And you are looking for a pursuer of God. So when it comes to dating, simply tonight, we are going to ask the question, what is a man? Our Our culture will tell you there's no such thing. The Bible tells you there's male and female, that God has a design. But our culture says, man, there's no such thing. So what is a godly man? I want to dig into that tonight. Every single thing I'm going to say comes straight from 1 Timothy 6. The points and the subpoints come straight from 1 Timothy 6. And we're going to walk through what this actually looks like to not lay on the spiritual sidelines, to own your faith, to be a man of God. In particular, with dating. Now, when Paul is speaking here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, What he's saying to Timothy, remember, Timothy is his disciple, his son in the faith, the one that he has poured into. Many of you who have discipled have a Timothy. You have someone in your life that you are pouring into, that you are equipping, that you are helping, that you are walking side by side with. Who's your Timothy and who's your Paul? For me, I have many people who have been Paul to me. Corey O'Hara, Jay Stevenson, Adam French. I I have had a multitude of men who have been my Paul. My Timothy, you know him very well, the one that I have poured into for years now is Dakota Tucker. And aren't you grateful for Dakota? Amen. I tell you what, I love that boy. Aren't you grateful for Jasmine and Skylar tonight? Amen. I tell you what, I love that team. 
These are people that I have the blessing to pour my life into and to teach and to grow and to help. Who's your Paul and who's your Timothy? You should always have somebody who's over you, pouring into you, who knows God and knows the Bible. And then you should always have people below you that you are investing in and raising up. He's giving an exhortation to Timothy. Now, he's telling him what a man of God is all about. What a man of God truly is. And that's what I want us to dig into tonight. So look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3. Let's pick this apart tonight. Verse 3, it says, If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, watch this, verse 4, he is conceited and understands nothing. Guys, Paul's not holding back. He is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. Have you ever been around somebody that just loves to argue all the time? You ever been around somebody like that? Sometimes we've been those people. But man, when you're in sin, you will cause so much division and so many disputes when you're living in sin. Paul says, if you're not chasing after God, you will be the one causing the disputes. Not other people, you. That's crazy. Arguments over words. It goes on to say, from these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement Mm. among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. Let's read that one more time for everybody in the room. Whether it's Nikes, I'm guilty, or whatever it is, just remember right here. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. In a world that is very materialistic, isn't it amazing that none of it's going with us? (laughs) Some of us are living for the materialistic things of this world, and when we die, you're going to be sorely mistaken. I can't remember who it was that said, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You never see, I can't remember who it was. He said, you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse because everything you had ain't going with you when you die. I can't remember who it was. Verse 8, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich, pay very, atten- pay very close attention here. For anybody that loves marble countertops. I'm not saying marble countertops are bad. I'm not saying money's bad. But pay very close attention here. Because this is, this is God. This ain't me. This ain't Daniel. This is Paul speaking to the power of the Spirit. But those who want to be rich, ouch, those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, there are many in this room who crave money. And it's going to lead you down a path of destruction. I'll tell you that right now. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Woo! And then he comes to verse 11. I love it. He says, but as for you, O man of God. Don't you love that? But as for you, O man of God, flee from these things. Run from these things and pursue Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. And Lord, we're humbled at the reading of your word. Father, we know that your word does not just contain truth. It is truth. And, Lord, it is active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And, Father, we pray, knowing your word will not return void tonight. God, I do pray that when it comes to singleness, dating, marriage, whatever season it is, God, I pray for all the men in the room that they would be men of God. I pray that the women in the room would be women of God. I pray that we would not be men and women of the world. I pray that we would not be men and women of the culture. Father, remind us that culture and Christian culture did not die on the cross for our sins. Your son Jesus did. Lord, don't let us obsess with culture. Don't let us obsess with money. Don't let us obsess with a season of life. Father, I pray tonight the glory would be on Jesus Christ. Help us to obsess over Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. If that's your prayer tonight, would you say amen? Amen. Number one, what does a man of God run from? I've got two points tonight. Very easy. Straight from the text. 
What does a man of God run from? <clears throat> so as we think about this with a dating mindset in our culture today, as we think about this with a relationship mindset, as we think about this with reviewing ourselves, Paul's relationship to Timothy is one of the most important relationships he has. Paul is going to tell Timothy what his godly best interest is. So when Paul tells Timothy to flee, he's telling him to run from the world. That there are things in this world, there are sins, there are materialistic gains, there are obsessions in our culture that will take you down. Essentially, Paul is warning Timothy, saying that men of God are not afraid to run when they need to run. But what do you run from? The very first thing, I want you to write this down. i got three subpoints. The very first thing he tells him to run from is a false doctrine. Amen. The very first thing he tells him to run from <clears throat> is false doctrine. Now, before I dig into this, I have to say this. Before you can ever be a man of God, you have to actually know God personally. Ladies, if he doesn't know Jesus, none of tonight is going to help you. <laughs> If he does not know Jesus, you don't need this sermon. He needs Jesus before you ever go date. <laughs> if he does not know Jesus, he cannot be a man of God. Fellas, ladies, if you do not know Jesus, you cannot be a man of God. You cannot be a woman of God. It does not matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how many blocks you check. Until you know God personally, you cannot be a man or woman of God. God has to do a work in you. He has to renew you. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, meaning you are completely changed from the inside out when you give your life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit enters your body. You have God's presence living within you, and you are quite literally a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Is anybody grateful for that tonight? Amen? Amen. You are a new creation in Christ. You are changed. There's some struggles that you have that take years to uproot. There's some sins and struggles you have that evaporate immediately. For me, when I got saved, there were some sins and struggles that just went away immediately, just disappeared. And there's other ones that were deeper in my heart, like fear that I had to allow God to work on me over the last six years in. There's, there's a work that's being had, but you have to know God personally before you can ever be a man of God. Paul speaks about being unequally yoked. And if you, are date, if you are a believer and you are dating somebody that's not a believer, you're not going to like this next part. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Do not be yoked together with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? So let me not come at you harshly. Let's just talk this out for a minute, okay? If the purpose of marriage is to glorify God, Agree? The whole purpose of marriage is to glorify God. Not for your pleasure, it's to glorify God. So the purpose of dating is to find someone who you can marry and bring ultimate glory to God. So if he doesn't know God, how does you dating him help anything at all? Because the purpose of marriage is to glorify God, and if he doesn't know God, if she doesn't know God, you can't glorify God. <laughs> so dating is about evaluating if they would make a godly spouse if there is character and chemistry involved. So if you are dating someone that's not a believer, I don't want to sound harsh, but I want to tell you, that decision has already been made for you. What you need to do is you need to share Jesus with them. You need to love them. You need to invite them to church. You need to, when they come to church, introduce them to other godly men so that you're not the only one they're connected to. If they're only coming to church and they only know you, that's not doing them any good. You ladies need to get them connected to godly men. You need to pray for them, but you don't need to date them. Because in dating, when you determine that they would not make a godly spouse, it's time to stop dating. And that's at the very beginning of the relationship when you find out they're not a believer. So you can talk to me afterwards if you want, but I'm telling you, when it comes to dating, if they're not a believer, that decision's already been made. They have to be somebody that knows the Lord. Otherwise, what's going to happen is, I wrote this down, I heard someone say this, it's not mine. Dating a person who is not a believer is the same as being handcuffed to someone in Texas. You want to walk to L.A., and they want to walk to New York. You are headed in two completely different directions, and what's going to happen is you will fight and argue and drag the other one to the way you're going, and it's going to end painfully. I, it's what Paul says, unequally yoked, righteousness, lawlessness. It doesn't make sense to any. You love them. They're a brother or sister. You love them. You encourage them. You pray for them to give their lives to Jesus. But when it comes to dating, that answer has already been made. So not just from a characteristic standpoint, ladies, fellas, 
do they know God from a salvation standpoint? Do they know God in a personal way? Now, when it comes to the Bible, Dakota has said it many times. I love when Dakota says this. He says that people will twist Scripture to fit their lifestyle. You ever heard that? He said it. If you've been around Dakota, you've heard him say it. I love this. A man of God doesn't twist Scripture to fit his lifestyle. A man of God flips his lifestyle to fit Scripture. Hallelujah. That, that right there, let's keep it up for a minute. A man of God does not twist Scripture to fit his lifestyle. A man of God flips his lifestyle to fit Scripture. Me and Dakota have seen many men try to justify smoking marijuana. Fellas, don't come to us talking about marijuana because you're going to leave mad. I can just tell you that right now. Me and Dakota both struggle with marijuana and came out of it. God saved us from it. And if you have a conversation with us about marijuana, we're going to tell you the truth about what God's word says. So reminded that your identity is wrapped up in marijuana. And I've heard so many men, I've heard so many women try to justify smoking marijuana. But at the end, you don't realize that it's ruining who you are because your value, your dependency now is on a drug. Don't do it, man. I'm telling you. We've heard people try to twist scripture to fit their lifestyle when it comes to pornography, man. It's happened. People try to twist scripture. Do you know what the Bible says? For the men in the room, but also the ladies in the room, do you know what God's word says enough to be able to spot false doctrine, false theology? Do you know? Ladies, does he know the gospel enough to spot a false gospel? I'm not saying that we have this entire book memorized, although that should be the goal by the end of our lives, essentially. But I'm not saying you have this memorized cover to cover, but do you know the gospel enough to be able to spot false doctrine? Do you know? Because you have to know the Bible for yourself if you're going to spot false teachings. You have to know what God's word said. Before you can ever spot the lies of the world, you first most, must first know the truth of Scripture. The Bible says a man of God runs from false doctrine. So ladies, does he twist scripture to fit his lifestyle? Does he make excuses? Does he blame people? When Saul in the Old Testament made the offering, when he wasn't supposed to make the offering and Samuel came, Saul blamed everyone but himself. Saul blamed Samuel. Saul blamed the people. Saul blamed God. Saul blamed his situation. A man of God does not make excuses. A man of God takes responsibility. So when you're dating, do you see how, this is what's amazing. The Bible does not speak about dating itself because it's new in our culture. But when you understand what the Bible has said about men and women, when you're dating, there's an evaluation period. You begin looking at the other person and evaluating. Do they know doctrine? They're not a theologian, but do they know the gospel? Do they know God's word? And then do they live it out? Is God's word the ultimate standard in their life or is it a side item? On their life. And I'm just, I'm giving you questions to answer. Because Paul says it again to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at this. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, verse 2, I love this, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come, listen to this, for the time will come, if it's not on the screen, you can just listen to me right here. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. The time will come, and the time's here, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will want to have an itch scratched in their ear. According to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves, and they will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to miss. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. God bless you. A lot of people would love for me to come up here and give like a self-help guide on dating, how to do it and all those kind of things. I, I can't do that for you. I've got to tell you what God's word says. And God's word says that a man of God knows the gospel. In fact, Galatians 1, 6 and 7, Paul deals with this issue. He says, I am amazed that you're so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel. That's Galatians 1, verse 6 and 7. So ladies, when it comes to dating, does the guy you're interested in know the word of God? Or is he easily swayed by the culture? Is he easily swayed by his feelings? Is he easily swayed by what's popular? Is he obsessed with materialistic gains and not obsessed with what the world says? I'm just giving you the right questions to ask. I can't answer those for you, but you can ask those questions. And then, ladies, for you, do you know the Word of God? Do you, ladies, know the gospel well enough to be able to see if the guy you're interested in is following 
bad doctrine. Do you know it? Because you can't evaluate somebody else's knowledge of the word if you're not willing to grow in your knowledge of the word. Fellas, can I get an amen? <laughs> Do you know it? See, there's this increasing knowledge of God's word that happens in our lifetime, slowly but surely. And as you grow in it, you grow in understanding how to spot bad theology. You know how to spot when the gospel's wrong. So when you're on YouTube or when you go to a service and everything I say, you should go right back to scripture and check it for yourself. Every time you hear the word, you are thinking back to where does it say it in scripture? Where does it say it in scripture? I just want to give you the right questions to ask. When Paul was dealing with that with the Galatians, the whole issue was they were still saying you needed to be circumcised. Hear me. The issue with the Galatians seemed small, but it was a big issue when it came to the gospel of Christ. Because it looked like, hear me out for a minute, it looked like they were just adding a little bit to the gospel, but in actuality, they were trying to reverse the gospel, is what was happening. And Paul comes to him and he says, I'm astonished that you are turning away from the gospel to which you have been preached. I gotta tell you, you can't add anything to the gospel because the gospel does not lack anything. Circumcision works. You can't add anything to the gospel because the gospel does not lack anything. The gospel is you have sinned, you have broken God's commands, you can't save yourself. But Jesus Christ came down, fully God, fully man, died for the sins of the world, rose from the grave again, and in him you have hope. In him he does the work in you that transforms you to be more like Jesus Christ. The gospel does not need, it, does not need anything added to it. The gospel is sufficient enough for its grace, for mercy, for all of these things. And Paul does not hold back because he says this. I'll make one more point to you before my next sub point. Paul says, those, hear me for a minute. God bless you. It's that time of year. Paul says, those who accept false teachings are conceited. Do you know the definition of conceited? You know what it means, but do you know the definition? It means to be excessively proud of oneself. Which leads me to my next sub point. A man of God runs from B, pride. Not an amen in the room. Thank you. I heard my wife. She said amen. Probably telling me to die to my pride. <laughs> amen, Daniel. Stop being all those sugar cookies. Paul says that from a man's pride comes unhealthy interests and disputes and arguments over words. Let me tell you something. A man of God doesn't go around looking to win fights. A man of God goes around looking to win souls. Does he go around looking to win fights? Fellas, do you go around looking to win fights? Is it all about you? Is it all about proving yourself? Is it all about making a name for yourself? Is it look at my accomplishments and look at my achievements? Look at what I can do. Look at who I can be. Is it all about you? Ladies, is it all about him? Does his world revolve around him? Does he get dizzy from having everything revolve around him? I'm just asking good questions because it says that from a man's pride comes envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions. I'll tell you what, you can learn a lot about a man from his interests. And essentially, ladies, he has three options. He can be obsessed with himself, he can be obsessed with you, or he can be obsessed with Jesus Christ. And guess what? If he's obsessed with himself, he hasn't truly understood how much of a sinner he is. Sorry, fellas, I'm getting on you, but I'm in the same boat with you. I'm in the same boat with you now. But if he's obsessed with himself, he hasn't really died yet to himself. If he's obsessed with you, you don't want him to be obsessed with you. Because guess what? You're a sinner too, and you can't be his source of life. But sadly, in our culture, a lot of ladies like when the man is obsessed with them. So they feed into it. They feed into it because they want that attention and they want that approval. So they want the man to be obsessed with them. No, you don't want him to be obsessed with you because you're a broken sinner too. What you want is a man and a woman who are obsessed with Jesus Christ, obsessed with the gospel, obsessed with loving God, loving people, sharing Jesus, making disciples, and you're just running towards Jesus, and you're running towards Jesus, and you're running so fast, you look to the left, and there's another person of the opposite opposite sex that's kind of cute, running towards Jesus too. And you stop for a minute and say, oh, they'd be nice to run this race with. And you don't fall because the stairs are right here. Some of you are like, Daniel, don't. <laughs> and you're running so fast after Jesus that you both kind of look at each other. Mm. I like your faith in God. No, I like your faith in God. Let's keep running. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, out of that, isn't that amazing? Out of that love for God, out of that love for the gospel, a relationship booms. It's amazing. Ladies, why would you want him to be obsessed with you? 
And I'm not, I'm not angry, man. Please don't hear I'm angry. I'm just fired up because our generation does dating so poorly, and I'm the worst of all. Before I met Hannah, my dating either ended in fizzling out or a dumpster fire. <laughs> it didn't go well for me. I was lost, and those dating opportunities sure didn't go well because I didn't know the Lord. And when I began dating as a new believer... I thought that if a girl had a Christian title, that she must be living it out in every area and really pursuing after God. <laughs> and Nate, I had a, a tough wake-up call. <laughs> that just because there's a Christian title doesn't mean they're a pursuer of God. I had to realize that the hard way. And for you guys, when it comes to the season of dating, ladies, when it comes to a man's pride, is he obsessed with himself? Because if he is, I can tell you what it's going to be like Dating him, being engaged to him, and being married to him. He is going to be selfish. He's going to be self-involved. He's not going to put your interests above his own, and that's not a road you want to go down. Is he self-involved? Is he prideful? Or has he come to a place of Galatians 2.20? <clears throat> Let me look it up. Because I don't want to misquote it, and my mind's going quickly tonight. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So the life that I now live in the faith in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but God who lives in me. Ladies, is it God living through him or is it him and his show? A man of God dies to himself. I'm not saying he's perfect, but he dies to himself. It's not about his world. He looks to others. Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Scripture don't play when it comes to pride. Scripture doesn't play when it comes to pride. In fact, when you look at Jesus, he is the absolute perfect picture of humility. Ladies, if I could give you any word, you are looking for somebody that looks like Jesus. It's that simple. You can go listen to every single dating podcast you want to. But at the end of the day, if he's not reflecting Jesus, if, he refl if he's reflecting the world or himself, that's a red flag. Fellas, if she's reflecting the world or herself, that's a red flag. You are looking for someone that is actively trying, not perfect, but Aliana, looking to live out. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite texts in the Bible because it speaks about the posture of Jesus. It talks about Jesus. Remember, this whole thing's about Jesus. You didn't come here to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. If you came here to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend, I'm going to ask you to leave. If you are only here, and I'm serious about this, you can tell anybody you want to. If you're not here looking for Jesus, looking to worship, looking for the word, if fellas, if you're just here trying to find a girlfriend, there's the door. Ladies, if you're just here looking for a boyfriend, there's the door. This ain't a place where we do that, and we're not going to let it happen. You can come in here, and you can find community. You can find worship. You can find prayer. You can find Jesus. But if you're in here just looking to date, please come talk to me or step out, because that's not going to happen in here. This is not a place where we find hookups, where we find mates. This is a place where we find Jesus Christ. I'm not mad at you. But, man, our culture needs to hear this so badly, do they not? I wish I would have got this when I was in your seat. You are here to find Jesus and to let Jesus make you look more like him. Philippians chapter 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, listen closely, please, to what this says. If there's any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection, and any sympathy. Paul says this. He says, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And then number, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Fellas, do you live this way? Do you live in a way where your selfish ambition has died and you're looking to others in humility? Do you live that way? Ladies, do you live that way? Are you trying? I'm not asking you for perfect, but are you striving through the power of the Spirit to live like Jesus? Then it says everyone, verse 4, should not look to, look to his own interests, but rather the interests of others. Why? Verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Is that not a beautiful verse? God bless you, man. But what he did is he emptied himself, assuming the form of a servant, 
taken on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under, uh, under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Aren't you grateful for the name of Jesus and that you don't lack anything? Amen? Aren't you grateful for the name of Jesus and the work of Jesus? That if you're single, you don't lack anything. Stop letting our culture tell you you do. If you have Jesus, you lack nothing. You lack nothing if you have Jesus. What do you lack? Nothing. There is no person who can do for you what only Jesus can. For years I tried to find my value in women and in girls through dating, through conversations, and yet, fellas, every single time I tried to, I ended up more empty than before. But when I found Jesus Christ, for me, my life was changed immediately. I was the last person you ever think would come to know Jesus. People in high school see me now, and they laugh at the fact that I'm a pastor because they were like, man, we never thought it would happen. <laughs> if you, they were like, if you can get saved, anybody can get saved. I cussed every other word. I struggled with sin, had no idea who I was. Lived in complete darkness, man. I was coaching basketball around a whole lot of older black men. All through college, I hung out with older black men, 40, 50, 60 years old, coaching basketball. And when I found Jesus as a 21-year-old college student, I came back to those coaches, and I remember the day they looked at me and they said, something's different about you, and I told them it's because I met Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know him? Because each one of us have a story. My story is unique. Your story is unique. But I tell you what is at the centerpiece. God is wanting to know you, and he's wanting you to make much of his name, not your own name. So have you died to pride? Or is pride your world? Is it all about you? And listen, man, I understand. I want as many college students who are willing to come and worship with us on Monday nights. But as I say this, you might not come back next week. Because this don't tickle the ear. In fact, this hurts, doesn't it? It hurt me writing it. But I would rather preach the truth of the gospel to you and you never come back than you come in here and hear some feel-good message and stay for a year. Die to your pride. You and I are nobody. But Jesus Christ is everything. Everything. He is everything. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, see the love of money. Daniel, do not tell me what to do with my finances. I got Dave Ramsey for that. <laughs> Daniel, do not tell me what to do with my finances. I got my parents for that. Daniel, don't tell me what to do with my finances. That's for me to say. Well, listen, Paul has a lot to say when it comes to the love of money. In fact, I'll point you back one more time. Verse 9, if you will. Look with me one more time. Verse 9. Paul says, But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Fellas, women, ladies, everybody in the room, I'll tell you something, man. The love of money will lead you down a very dark path. And... There's a lot of us in here who are obsessed with our career. There's nothing wrong with having a career. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's a lot of incredible members at Bellevue who give their money away to missions and to believers every year and never get any credit for it. There's nothing wrong with money. I'll tell you this, though. The love of money can take you down faster than almost anything else. There's a reason why Paul spends so much time talking about it. Fellows, are you obsessed with your career and with making money? Ladies, are you obsessed with your career and making money? Is, is the man you're interested in obsessed? Is he in love with money? Because you cannot serve two masters. You either serve Jesus or you serve your bank account. <laughs> One of them does not change at all, and the other changes every single hour, especially if you eat out a lot. <laughs> Cookout, Huey's, believe me, I already know. Kroger. <laughs> dessert section. Man, if my identity was in my money, I'd be going up and down all the time because I can't get out of the dessert section at Kroger. Coming out with holiday edition sugar cookies. <laughs> Orange, fall. The Christmas ones are coming next. <laughs> 
Our culture has so many misconceptions when it comes to being a man. Five years ago, if you will, I want to give you an illustration personally. Five years ago, I went to a sorority formal event. I was a junior at the University of Memphis, and I was excited to go to this event because I had my eye on one of the ladies. I thought she was cute. And at the beginning of the semester, I checked her social media, and I saw that she had a boyfriend. So I said, ah, dang, I'm out the game then. Semester progresses on. They break up, and I'm like, all right, I'm back in the game. Time to brush off the shoulders. Time to do it. Time to get back in. Here we go. Back in the game. I never got into class so happy that day than when they had broke up. I was lost. And I sound so bad. <laughs> I sound so bad. Don't be like me. I was lost. I didn't know the Lord. All right? I didn't know the Lord yet. B.C. <laughs> All right? I was lost. I didn't know the Lord yet. I'm not using it as an excuse. He's using it as a reason. And uh, I was really excited for this sorority formal event. I wasn't in a fraternity. Far from it. I wasn't in a club or an organization. I was a regular college student, quiet in the back of the classroom. But I had my eye on this girl. I thought that she would be cool. And, and uh, we, I got invited to go to the sorority formal event. And I took some notes because oh, I didn't want to mess this up. I wanted to get to the point. I didn't want to talk too long about it. At this formal event, I didn't know anybody. And whenever you go to an event, some of you feel like that when you come to The View. Isn't it awkward when you don't know anybody? I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I would just stand there and swipe through my apps, you know, <laughs> just swipe back and forth. Like, I've seen them a thousand times where I'm just trying to look like I was doing something. And uh, I didn't know anybody that night. And uh, <clears throat> I had a couple of conversations that night, Abigail, that really opened my eyes to what my generation and your generation was chasing after for their purpose and their value. This night was a big one for me. I would get saved. If you want to know the timeline, I got saved one month later. So this was a big night for me. The Lord used this night to really open my eyes. Some of the conversations I had were with fraternity guys. Some of them weren't fraternity guys. It's not that they were in a fraternity or sorority. There were all kind of people there. It, it, it is not about whether they were in an organization or not. It was just all college age kids there. And every single one of them were talking about the same things. One conversation I got in was a group of guys, and all they could talk about the entire time was money. I mean, the entire conversation was about how much money they had and how much money they were going to make. It's like they were obsessed with a dollar amount in a bank account. It's all they would talk about. And I was a physical education major. I was trying to be a coach. So my mind wasn't really on money, to be honest with you. I was just trying to help the kids and coach them up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So they were like, engineers? Nursing majors, you choose, whatever you want to choose. But all they would talk about is money and how, oh, when I get to this stage, when I have this amount of money, man, I'm going to do this. And really at their core, it was so sad to see they had placed their value into a dollar amount in their bank account as if that's what made them a man. Isn't it sad we live in a materialistic culture today where people think a money dollar sign amount makes them a man? You can be the most rich person in this world and be the most poor person spiritually that ever existed too. At the same time, your wealth and your gains do not make you a man. Another conversation, the vibe was way different. Shift out of that conversation. I'm not going to make any money through PE, so I shift to another conversation. A bunch of other random guys. We're just standing there. We're talking. And <clears throat> when I was lost, I was not, it feels weird to say this, I was not the worst you could be. Um, and I know you're like, Daniel, what are you talking about? We're all sinners. I get that. But there were some, I'll say this, there were some sins the Lord still protected me from when I was lost. The best way I can put it is there were some sins the Lord still protected me from when I was lost. And so when I got into a conversation with another group of guys, they were objectifying women in a way that I had never heard. And I had been in locker rooms. I had been around guys my whole life, went to public school. But even in this conversation, I sat there and listened for 20 minutes as they talked about the entire reason they came to this formal event. I came because I had a crush on a girl that I thought was kind of cute. They all came because their main purpose was to take one of them home and sleep with them and not call them the next day. They weren't just all fraternity guys. They were just regular college guys. And that was, that's what they said they were talking about. That's what they said they were talking about. Exchange photos. Exchange conversations about, man, I'm here because I'm taking so-and-so home, and we're going to sleep together, and I'm not going to call it tomorrow. And what was amazing, I never forgot this moment. There's a reason why I'm telling you this. In this moment, one of their buddies, I don't know if he was a believer or not, Elijah, I don't know, but one of their buddies wasn't going along with it. And they didn't know me, so they wouldn't say anything to me. But he wasn't going along with it. He wasn't looking at the pictures. He wasn't talking about who he was taking home. Maybe he had his eye on somebody else that he thought he was cute. I don't know. I was like, my, my God, you know, <laughs> innocent, <laughs> you know. And he wasn't going along with it. And I'll never forget this, because they looked at him as he wasn't going along with it. They looked at him, and they said this. They said, man, dude, would you just be a man? 
in this moment, as he refused to objectify women and talk about his plans to take them home and engage in sexual immorality before marriage, they said, why don't you just be a man? What they had done in this moment is they had taken sexual immorality, sex before marriage, and they had used that as the definition of what makes up a man. That's where our culture is today. Our culture tells you that the more women you can sleep with, the more manly you are. And fellas, that's the furthest from the truth you will ever be. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Ladies, the culture is telling you that the best way that you can promote yourself on Instagram, the best way that you can position yourself and show your Show yourself off that that's going to bring your value, that's going to bring your worth, that the attention of this culture is going to give you worth, and that couldn't be farther from the truth of what Scripture says. What is a man? Is a man defined by sexual immorality? Is a man defined by the amount of money in his bank account? No. A man is defined by what he does with his relationship with Christ. A woman is defined by what she does with her relationship with Christ. And I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that God created sex. He's not anti-sex. He's pro-sex because he created sex. Newsflash. (laughs) God has designed sex for a particular ordained season of life. He has called it for marriage. Because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And having sex before marriage does not make you a man or a woman. It's sin. When it comes to money, what God has called us to do is he's called us to give. He's called us to look not only to the interests of others. I would be so bold to say that when you get to heaven, your reward will not at all be based upon what you got in this life. Your reward in heaven will be based on what you gave in this life. How do we know that? Because God is a giver. All over scripture, God gives, God gives, God gives. And in fact, you know what? He gave the thing that was most precious to him, Kate. He gave his son. God gave his son. Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. Sam, he humbled himself and gave his life for you. God gave all that he could for you. He gave his son, Jesus. And that's what he's called you to do, to give. When it comes to sexual immorality, a man of God will honor purity over his own pleasure. A woman of God will honor purity over her own pleasure. Hey, I'm not just abstaining from sex before marriage because I think it's a smart thing to do. I'm doing it because that's what God has called me to do. That's the standard God has set. And as I've said last week, for anybody in here who has fell into that sin, there is great restoration in the name of Jesus. There is nothing he can't heal you from. Amen. That's some of the things Paul says a man of God runs from. But he doesn't just run from something. He's running to something greater. Number two, what does a man of God run to? Not only does a man of God run from something, which we saw in 1 Timothy 6 was namely false doctrine, Pride, the love of money, but he runs to something. Look with me at verses 11 to 14. He says, but you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. A is righteousness and godliness. Righteousness and godliness. What a man of God is running to, he's running to righteousness, and he's running to godliness. A godly woman is running to righteousness And godliness, a big concern that Paul had with the believers he ministered to is that they trusted God with their eternity, but they did not trust God with their life. And that's a big thing in our culture today amongst believers, and here's a great fear. We we trust God with our salvation, but we don't trust him with our relationships. How can you, and I just want to ask you a question, how can you trust God with your soul, but you can't trust him when it comes to dating? But you can't trust them when it comes to your career. You can't trust them when it comes to where you live. How can you really believe that God is going to bring your soul to heaven one day, but you you can't believe that he's going to bring you what you need in this earth, in this world? How? That's what Paul's concern was. And when we do this, here's what happens. We take the timing 
out of God's hands and we put the timing into our hands. When we don't trust God, we will always take control of timing. And when this happens, we settle. Hear me for a minute because this is some of the realest stuff I'm going to tell you tonight. My great fear is that some of you so badly want to get out of singleness that you're going to settle. And I'm not talking about looks. I'm not talking about status. I'm talking about you're going to settle on the standards that Paul has lined out. You're going to settle instead of chasing, instead of being together with a pursuer of God, you're going to end up with somebody who just has great church attendance. You're going to settle and you're going to compromise because you so quickly just want to jump into it, just want to jump into it. Man, we got we to be official. We got to jump into it. And we want to take the timing out of God's hands and put it in our hands. One of the best quotes comes from Ben Stewart. I think Ben Stewart has done a great job with the resources he's put out. And this is one of my favorite quotes he said. Look at this. He says, you not only want a believer in God, but a pursuer of God. Anybody can say they love Jesus. That's not hard. A friend of mine in college was sexually assaulted on a first date with a guy who had a Bible on his coffee table and a Christian bumper sticker on his car. And you know what, man? Tonight's not the night for it, but there are those in here who have been through sexual assault. And I want to say if that's something that you have been through at Bellevue Baptist Church, we have an amazing biblical counseling department. We have people here who would love to talk to you, who would love to help you, not from what the world says, but from the Bible, because there's healing in Christ. And I know that there's been that in this room. I would not dare ask you to raise your hand or come up here, nothing like that. But I'll tell you, we could provide you with the connection to biblical counseling where you could find help, where you could find restoration, because there is for you. He goes on to say in this quote, a friend of mine in college was sexually assaulted on first date with a guy who had a Bible on his coffee table. I think I skipped a line on that. Oh, here we are. When I was in college, I remember watching guys who were players incorporate more religious language when they were hitting on good Christian girls. Beware. You do not want to date a guy or a girl who is just playing games with God. It does not matter to me one bit if someone regularly sits in church, posts on social media about being blessed, or gets a big tattoo of a Bible verse on their body. <laughs> Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And there's no shame if you have that Bible verse tattooed on you. I just hope you know the context. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You need to watch their life over a period of time. I love that he says that. He says you need to watch their life over a period of time. You want to be able to see the why behind the decisions they make. The motivation you want to see is that they desire to please the Lord. That drive comes from within the prompting of the Holy Spirit working in their life. For anybody considering dating or those who are dating, if they are not pursuing after God, it's going to end painfully. It's going to end very painfully. If they're not in, I'll go back to last week. If they're not in prayer and they're not in the word, it's going to end painfully. Your source of life cannot be a relationship on this earth. It must be a relationship with your creator. And I love this because Paul even talks about this about a man of God. He says, be endurance and patience. So not only does a man chase after righteousness and godliness, this is my last point as well. He chases after endurance and patience. Endurance and patience. Isn't that amazing? So ladies, let me ask you a hard question here. Is he operating on God's timing or his own timing? Whose timing does he live on? Does God have control of the clock or does he? Is he in a rush? Is it, is it gotta, hey, we gotta get there now, we gotta get to it quick? Is God at all brought into it so that God can run the show or is he running the show? Ladies, who's running your clock? Are you the one running the time or is God running the time? Because I gotta tell you, impatient, I think I wrote this down, Impatient believers are probably going to end up ungodly believers. Scripture speaks all about patience. And if you cannot wait upon the Lord, you will find yourself in ungodliness. If you cannot be patient before the Lord, you will find yourself in sin, in envy, in quarreling, in destruction. What I love is Paul says, take a hold of eternity, Bree. He says, take a hold of eternity. As you navigate this life, you navigate it with eternity in mind, which means this is about the long game. This is not about the short game. This is not about jumping into an official relationship as quick as you can. It's not about changing your Facebook status. It's not about going official on the gram. It's not about being on TikTok together. It's not about that, guys. It's not. It's about waiting upon the Lord 
and playing the long game so that his timing is the one running the show, not your timing, because his timing is going to be far better than your timing anyway. If it was up to your timing, you'd have been in a relationship seven years ago. Think about where you were a few years ago. For me, nowhere near ready to be in a relationship. God's timing is perfect. In fact, Proverbs 16, my last verse I'll give you, 16, verse 32, says that patience is better than power and controlling one's emotions than capturing a city. Patience is better than power and controlling one's emotions than capturing a city. A man of God is led by Jesus, not anything else. Fellas, the best thing you can do for your future marriage is pursue after Jesus as hard as you can and let him lead you. Ladies, the best thing you can do for your future marriage is pursue after Jesus with everything you have and let him lead you. As I said tonight, I pray that you're encouraged and that you're reassured, but I also pray that you're challenged and convicted because that's how God's word operates. God will encourage you, but he will also challenge and convict you. And I'll tell you, I have not figured it out. I have not figured it out. I'm in the same boat with you. I am growing slowly to be more like Jesus. I have not figured this thing out. I am growing I am maturing. Hannah is growing. She is maturing. We are in the same boat with you. I don't preach this because I am above you. I'm slightly ahead of you in life. And God's called me to be your pastor, so he's called me to preach truth to you. I'm ahead of you. I've made some of the mistakes you are making and will make. And hear me on this. I've been there, and my desire for you is to help you do it even more godly than I did it. But I am not perfect. I am growing and I am in the same boat you are. But I will tell you this, as somebody who is out of college and married, probably coming up on kids soon, I'll tell you what, that's not an announcement, but we're getting there. <laughs> I'll tell you this, God's timing is far better than your timing will ever be. Be patient on the Lord. Be patient on the Lord. Wait for the Lord. He will be faithful to you. He has a plan. He is molding you. He is shaping you. He is tonight sanctifying you. Tonight, there's going to be a lot of men who walk out of here, and they're going to live different tomorrow because of this word. There's going to be a lot of ladies in here who's going to walk out, and they're going to live different tomorrow because of this word, because that's what God's word does. It is sanctifying you, and it is changing you.